Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode two of the Bad Company podcast, the podcast for American Arms Channel. I'm the host, Drake, and today we're going to be talking about a topic near and dear to my heart. But first, I wanted to give a shout out to our only sponsor at the moment in spring of 2020 amid the coronavirus pandemic. Oh, Lord. The pandemic is not so much, in my opinion, that of a virus, but more of a sickness on the mind. But we can talk about that another time. Um, Warwolf Ordnance was kind enough to send along some ammunition, so I'd like to give them a couple shout-outs here and there, especially when we come to featuring their loads later this spring on the pattern board and, of course, on some mediums that might be... uh, Consider a little silly, but hopefully a lot of fun for you guys. So if you're not a subscriber to the channel, go ahead and click that subscribe button and that notification bell to stay up to date on everything we have on American Arms' YouTube channel. And uh, we will uh, keep you guys up to date. Go check them out at warwolfordnance.com. They're a uh, small-time ammunition manufacturer out of Post Falls, Idaho. Kip over there is a really great guy. I've communicated with him through uh, email and... uh, Man, they were super kind to send way more ammo than I expected them to. So I just want to keep giving them shout outs as I can because this stuff is super high quality. I can't wait to get the Browning 10 gauge back in hand and shoot it this spring. We'll jump off that bandwagon in just a second, but I will say that as I say on their website, if you see anything that they don't have that you are interested in, shoot them an email, give them a call. They'll do their very best to accommodate you and get you the ammo they need at a very reasonable price for such a premium, high-quality ammunition. Whether it's in 12 or 10, they also offer other gauges on the website. It may not be in stock, but give them a call. They'll probably be able to help you out. So, with all that intro done... Let's talk about hunters, specifically how hunters are our own worst enemy. Now, if you are young, if you're old, no matter how many years you've had uh, hunting, if you've hunted long enough, you know, if you've been an outdoorsman long enough, you've probably run into some people that share your passions, but maybe are not the most polite. Maybe you can reflect yourself upon a time where you really should have been a better neighbor and a better man uh, to the to the kid or the woman or the the other man uh, directly across from you or the ones you're communicating with in regards to to anything, let alone hunting and, and outdoor recreation sports. But um, you know we're we're all sinners. We're all guilty at some point of something. We all have our transgressions. It's it's owning our mistakes and it's owning our sin and and, and moving forward and knowing that we need to do better. And that will be the uh, the lesson of this podcast, I suppose, in summation. But really, when it comes to hunters, we are really our own worst enemy. And you can say that by a lot of groups. But um, seeing how this is a very hunting-focused medium here on the American Arms Channel and the Bad Company podcast, everything we talk about is going to have some ire of guns, gear, hunting, outdoor recreation, self-defense, freedom, you know, all of those things uh, are in the same kind of bubble. And those groups, no matter which group your your passion segments you into, we have our issues with, with not treating each other kindly. And maybe you, you know, maybe you're not a big, uh, a big transgressor when that, uh, when that subject's brought up, you know, maybe you really haven't done anything, but you've run into people, especially that have been very rude. And unfortunately, the people who can seem to be the meanest are the keyboard warriors. Yes, the Facebook groups, the forum posts, the YouTube commenters. And you have the anonymity of a keyboard or a fake account or, you know, an account that you don't have any content with. People seem to let the worst come out of them and don't self-regulate. And, you know, I would have to say that they're just letting their demons out online, but in a lot of ways, if you feel that you can do that with anonymity, what keeps that from coming out in the real world? So I've been speaking very vaguely, obviously, coming up to this point, but I want to preface this this topic here. And I want to say that, uh, you know, as hunters, we are stewards, and we need to not only be stewards of the land and of the game our creator has blessed upon this world, but we need to make sure that we are stewards of our own sport and that we are stewards of creating 
new stewards, that we that we continue to bring in new adults, and that we raise our children, our little boys, our little girls properly. We bring them up in the sports. We bring them up in recreation. We bring them up in the tradition and not just teaching them how to go kill a deer or how to trap a muskrat or how to set a, a, a tent up or how to make a campfire. It's not just the action. It's not just the task. It is a entirety of the experience. It is the visceral experience. It is the worldly experience. It is the spiritual experience and is the goodness the goodness of understanding these things are within our grasp and control and we have to do our very best to preserve and conserve them. So that being said, that's a little bit of food for thought. I want to have you guys keep that in your, your mind's eye while we talk about a couple examples here. So kind of saying this, why are we cruel to others You know, in general? Why do certain people feel the need to be cruel? Bit of a rhetorical question, but maybe something you can ponder on yourself. Specifically in this topic, why do we find it so behooving to our own ego to, to ridicule, criticize, call out, shoot down, crush other individuals for their decisions? How they like to hunt, how they like to camp, how they like to to hike, uh, how they like to fish. Uh, hunting is, is of course, seems to, you know, the, the topic of this discussion, but it seems to be the biggest contention point with a lot of people. And, and what I tend to see is the, well, my daddy or my uncle didn't raise me to shoot like that or hunt like that, so it's wrong. You're wrong. You're a terrible person. You're a horrible. I don't know why I'm Southern all of a sudden, but apparently somebody from, from deep Alabama is a, is a terrible human being. And, uh, and likes to uh, criticize others. That that's a bad default to go to, but you, you get the point, right? It, it's it doesn't matter where you're from or who you are. There is always somebody halfway across the world online that wants to criticize you. Halfway across the country, maybe even down the street. I've also seen it in person, and I've experienced it in person from family members, and that's not right, folks. That's not right at all. So let me stop being vague and maybe get into examples here. But, you know, one thing that really kicked this off recently for me and why I wanted to uh, to come to you guys in, in this episode of the podcast and have a monologue about this and maybe prompt some thought and encourage you to, to go out and be stewards of the land, be stewards of our sports and of the hunting tradition. In America, and if you're an international listener and you have opportunities to hunt, f- fantastic. Do the same in your communities the way that you know how to preserve your traditions. Uh, but one of the primary things that I saw was was that uh, deer. Well, the whole thing that kicked this off was deer and deer hunting shared a, a video from a couple years ago, and the video is titled "I Shoot Three Bucks in Thirty Five Seconds." That sounds like clickbait, uh, but uh, <laughs> if you're like me, well, 35 se- oh, who's I got 35 seconds. I want to see you kill three bucks in 35 seconds, right? That sounds like a lot of fun. That sounds really cool. Uh, whether you like the idea of shooting three bucks in 35 seconds or not, and we'll get into that in a second, there is, uh, there, there's merit there. It's like, okay, yeah, I want to take a look at that. Well, well, deer and deer hunting on Facebook on their page, they, they shared uh, this video and they wanted to ask the, the community, their, their followers, what we thought, if you were, a, if you were a follower or not, or you'd like to visit their page, of course, that pages do this all the time. Publications do this all the time. It's not a, it's not a new fantastic thing. Uh, but what I saw after watching the video is I scrolled down in the comments and I started to see almost a five to one or six to one ratio of people hating on the guy or screaming, that's wrong. That's illegal. Uh, that shouldn't be legal. Uh, he should have his license stripped away. Even a few people basically threatening that he should have some sort of physical harm put on him. I even saw an older gentleman comment that he's not going to watch the video, but it's completely unacceptable and it's greedy and wasteful to shoot three bucks. So, a guy that didn't watch the video has no idea what the context is, what's going on in the video, 
what it's about, has made a judgment, says he's not going to watch it, has made up his mind, goodbye. The person's horrible. The person that shot these three deer in a row in 35 seconds is a horrible, horrible guy. In essence, that's what this dude's saying. So maybe that gives you an idea of, of the kind of people that were commenting on this. And I was blown away. You know, you expect those people, you expect the people with serious concerns or dissent, like, oh, I don't like that, you know, and have conversations about it. But it was overwhelmingly a lot of guys on this post that were moaning and complaining about how terrible this was and how unsafe this guy was. And I want you to uh, to maybe take a second right now, pause this podcast, go down into the description below, go to the pinned comment if you're listening on YouTube, which is the only medium at this time. But um, listen to, excuse me, watch what this video is. It will take you all of about three minutes and the guy who does the shooting, the hunter that, that, that killed the three bucks, it was part of this deer drive, gives a pretty good breakdown of what he did. And it's all GoPro footage, so you don't get to see too much too clearly. You're kind of going off what he says. So I'll give you guys more of a breakdown because I've watched the video about a dozen times. But um, but pause pause this and and go watch that real quick. All right, so if you've watched it, You'll know what we're talking about. If not, no worries. We'll continue on as if you did. But um, also, the uh, the Facebook post is linked in the description down below. If you're listening at a later date, hopefully uh, the post has not been taken down or lost to the uh, backlogs of internet mystery. <laughs> Probably a better expression for that, but oh well. Uh, so this guy, you know, if you watch the video, he... 35 seconds, he shoots a deer, probably roughly three, or not 300, excuse me, 200 yards. And he drops that buck. He shoots two or three rounds at some bucks that are running through the woods and then uh, jogs forward. You could say run, but it's more of a jog. Jogs forward, slips another couple rounds in the magazine tube, has two bucks run up over a knoll that have just been shot at by his uncle, who is also driving deer towards him. He's sitting in the center, and there's two groups of his family members driving hit towards him. Uh, he shoots one buck. It obviously takes a hit and veers right and is going to go down soon. He shoots the next one, and it keeps running. He picks back up on it, recovers from the shot, shoots it, dumps it. Now he's got to go make sure all of his deer are down. He gets to see that the one deer went down and over. He can see the other deer he shot is flat line done. He shot that one twice. He goes up. He sees that the first buck he shot is still alive. He steps out around some brush to get a clearer shot, fires a dispatching shot into the deer, walks up to it. It's still got a little bit of last moments of life in the muscles left, so it's kind of twitching out, but you can tell this deer is gone. That's not life left. If you've, if you've seen enough deer be killed or you've killed enough deer, you'll know that not every shot is an instant incapacitation, and not every follow-up shot is an instant incapacitation. Body shots especially, they may kind of what I call twitch out. So the deer did. He walks up, he grabs it by the antlers, flops it on its side because it's kind of wadded up underneath some brush. Not a big deal, right? Nothing about this hunt screamed at me that he was extremely unsafe or anything like that. All of his backstops were pretty good. The only questionable shot was his first shot at that top of the knoll buck. We can't even really see where the buck is. And when he walks up to recover that buck, we can see that that hill really isn't that much of a hill. He's more of in a bowl, and that's more like a plateau. So even if he fired this 20-gauge SST slug at a high angle and missed that deer over the horizon, it's not going far. And he's on private property. He knows where he is, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line, there's not a lot of safety concern in my mind when watching this. So, you know, I obviously go back down. I take a look at these comments, and, and there's guys talking about, oh, he's so unsafe. He shouldn't never have a gun. Uh, there's people talking about how three bucks is just greedy and, and exaggerated, et cetera. Or not exaggerated, excuse me, is uh, excessive. Um, that he should be ashamed of himself, that's not real hunting, da-da-da-da-da. I started reading all these comments, I'm like, what is going on here? What is wrong with these people? Why are they bashing this dude for having such a successful deer drive? And this guy, he lives in Maine, where deer drives are legal, 
and where party tagging is legal. So he shot these three bucks legal. The whole point of this deer drive was to put meat in the freezer for this family. You know, if you if you watch the whole video, you understand he kind of sums up that it went into everybody's freezer. It went into multiple freezers. I mean, the whole party got to share. When you do a party hunt, when you do a party drive, um, basically what you're saying is no matter if we kill one deer or we fill every tag we've got, everybody gets meat right? Everybody's getting some meat, no matter who shoots it. How is that greedy? So if, I, if if one guy fills all the tags, yeah, it would be nice if one of the other guys got a buck or got a doe. But what's the problem with that? So, you know, all these concerns and all these complaints and just nasty comments, a dude who did nothing wrong. And that made me go on a bit of a tirade. I started engaging in the comments, trying to provoke some response out of dudes, you know, asking what makes this not a legitimate hunt? What's any difference? And a lot of what I got, a lot of what I got was it's not the way I do it, so it's wrong. So there's this the, the this mindset among certain individuals that because it doesn't fit within their Operatus Mirandi, or however you say that, whether it fits within their their code, their ethical code, their their sportsmanship code, quote unquote. They are confusing the morality of the action with their ethics. So their ethics are dictating my sportsmanship is that I am not going to take more than one buck in a season. And that uh, I'm only going to shoot it broadside, standing still, within a distance I know I'm capable of shooting. And that I will not shoot it running deer. I don't participate in deer drives because I don't find that sporting. Blah, 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 whatever. Fantastic for you, dude. I hope you enjoy every single hunt you go on. I hope you are successful next season. I hope you are successful the rest of the seasons of your life. I hope you get out there and continue to enjoy the outdoors. But the way you do it, does not mean it's the only way and does not mean that the way somebody else did it is wrong. And that's what you need to get over. Guys like that, girls like that, that decide that I am the way have a superiority complex. I will dare say a God complex. They feel the world should work the way that John Doe or Jane Doe sees it. And that's the only way. It doesn't matter if they're hunters or if they're anti-hunters. It doesn't matter if they're Republicans or Democrats. It doesn't matter if they're leftists or, or far-right, you know, conservatives or, or, you know, it doesn't matter if, you know, what's the difference between a communist and a Nazi? They're both bad. Being set in your way so harshly that you cannot see that somebody else can live freely, not harming you, doing it differently, and that's okay, that is is a level of immaturity and just denseness that I can't fathom having. One, because I wasn't raised to be that way. And two, because, you know, I may be fairly young. Uh, I'm uh, much younger than 30. I'm, I'm heading that direction this year. I'm over the other side of 25 now. But, you know... <laughs> I, I feel that I have I am mature, that I am an adult, right? And that I can see that. For some reason, individuals can't. And, and that's part of the reason why hunters are our own worst enemy. You get people who, who claim they're hunters and then start screaming that that's not hunting, this person's not a hunter, blah, 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 blah. You know, I can, I can see the argument. I don't feel that penned hunts, caged hunts, where you're hunting a shooting preserve is really hunting, whether it's birds or deer or elk or whatever it may be. I don't feel that that's hunting. I feel that that is paying for livestock that you get to dispatch. Is it fun? Oh, probably. Yeah. I can imagine it really is, especially with birds because you still got to shoot straight. Um, with deer, well, you got to shoot straight, but they're probably pretty tame and kind of just walk around. Right. But once again, I don't feel that it is necessary to say that that should be banned. People shouldn't be allowed to do that. They should feel horrible about themselves. I don't feel it's right. You know, if it, I, I don't feel like you should pay to go kill your, your animal. If you're going with an outfitter and it's fair chase and stuff, I feel like that's a good hunt. I mean, 
but if you've got the pocket change and you want to kill this just monstrosity of an animal and you want to go to a, an outfitter like that, I wouldn't even call them an outfitter, I would call it a facility. But once again, that's my bias. That's my ethical code. Is it morally wrong to harvest that animal, livestock or not? I'm going to kill that that, that deer or that, that elk or, or that pheasant, whatever it may be. It's going to die at some point. It's going to be harvested. And its body is going to be used to feed someone. It's going to be nutrition for someone or something. It's going to return back into the earth as it came out of. So what's the big problem, right? What's the, what's the difference? There's no, nothing morally wrong with humanely dispatching, humanely harvesting that animal. At its core, it is moral and good to harvest that animal and make use of its body for nutrition, for ourselves, for our family, for our pets. It is good. Now, it is bad to kill that animal, obviously, in any situation, whether it's fair chase or caged or anything like that, and make waste of it. To only do it for the sake of the kill. That is wasteful. That is gluttony. That is sin. And that's why we have game laws against that. You must utilize the meat from your take. You must do everything you can to recover a wounded animal. So we've got that morality covered, right? Ethics don't need to play any role in it. Our, our sportsmanship, our personal code or honor, whatever we've deemed to be so, doesn't need to have anything in it because the morality of the action is good or bad. So in this particular case, the morality of that action is good. He took three bucks. He did it efficiently he did it the best way he could yes he took shots at distance on running bucks i don't believe i would personally take but if i was standing there in his shoes confident in the arm that i had chosen for that hunt i may very well take that shot as well now with a slug gun eh, it, it depends with a rifle especially my ar oh yeah i probably would i probably would actually maybe be able to connect on one of them but once again i would be analyzing my shots every time okay box running lead focus is there a good backstop is it a good shoot do i know where my hunting partners are this gentleman seemed to have made that decision and decided it was good to shoot at those deer again personally wouldn't choose to do that felt it was a waste of ammo probably was going to be better off just maybe taking one hail mary and then cutting off, topping off, waiting, seeing if the, they come horseshoe back around towards him, which they did. Um, but he made that decision, right, in this video, in, the, in this hunt. And there's guys criticizing that. There's guys criticizing absolutely everything. And, and what I found, once again, was that people were arguing their ethics were what should guide the hunt, not the morality. And I posed the question to several individuals, what makes, like I said, what makes this any less of a hunt on a deer drive than you sitting over a deer path for six or eight hours in a day waiting for a deer to come through? They're still wild animals. They can go any direction they want. They can't go vertical, obviously, because they're not a bird. But any direction on land they want, they can go. They're deer. You're just hedging a bet that there's a path they are most likely going to take. So you're doing the same thing when you're sitting over a deer path or sitting over a pile of corn or, you know, there's all these ways we can harvest animals, that we can hunt an animal. What makes it any less of a hunt to drive a deer than it is to drive pheasants, to, to use a bird dog to kick up pheasants, to decoy ducks and geese in? Oh, that's not real hunting. You just tricked that bird with a fake bird. You see what I'm saying? It's that kind of mentality. It's not a fully fledged thought process, in my opinion, and I feel objectively it's not a fully fledged thought process. So, it, you know, there's, it's really difficult to pin down what these individuals are really complaining about. I think a lot of it is jealousy, and I think a lot of it is just being set in your ways. 
And that's not an excuse. That is a bad thing. They, Like I said in the beginning of the podcast, they cannot objectively stand back and go, wait a second, I don't like that. Why don't I like it? Is it wrong? Did he do something wrong? Well, personally, I wouldn't do that. But did he objectively do something right or wrong? It was a good shoot. It was a good harvest. Okay, perfect, great, happy for him. Not my cup of tea. We don't have the maturity level with a lot of people, I guess. And, and unfortunately, I saw a lot of these individuals, you know, you click on the profile picture and you realize this individual is older. They are, I hate to use this term because I know some of my audience is going to be of the older age. And I say that as a very young guy that will someday be of older age, God willing, but they are boomers, right? They are what kids and, and young people and even millennials like myself would call boomers. Um, and it's not to say that they are actually baby boomers. They are FUDs. Maybe that's a better term. They are FUDs. They are unwilling to change their opinion and their outlook on the world. They are, like I said, it's like arguing what's worse, communism or fascism. It's the same damn thing with a different uniform. It's the same damn thing. If you're going to be an a-hole, I don't care how old you are. I don't care what gender you are. I don't care what you look like, your, your color of your skin, or, or your religious outlook on life. If you're going to be an a-hole, you're an a-hole, and that's how I'm going to label you. So if you're going to call, and, and I'm legitimately saying this, this was said in the comments, and I confronted somebody like, why, why would you say this? Why would you wish ill on a fellow hunter? Well, you know, he, oh, he should have his, uh, he should have his license revoked for life, and he should, one guy said basically, uh, DNR, uh, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Organization of whatever state should, you know, go into his a-hole with a, with a rusty axe or, or saw blade or, or something like that, like, metaphorically just jack him up. Why would you want somebody's rights to be taken away? Because they did something you don't really like, but it's not wrong. That is the insanity of, I guess, internet anonymity. I think it's the insanity of people in general. I think we've got a healthy dose of a population in this world, and particularly in the states. And unfortunately, it is obviously not um, absent in the hunting and outdoor recreation community of people that simply have hatred and despise in their hearts. And we need to change that. We need to do everything we can not to dissent amongst ourselves and cause division because you like to bow hunt and I like to gun hunt, which is a very common bow hunters and gun hunters, you know, more so bow hunting elitists calling out gun hunters as being the terrible jackasses that they are and, and they ruin everything and, you know, it goes on and on. It doesn't matter what kind of hunting. Waterfowling in particular is really bad with older dudes not helping younger dudes, or somebody online asking for a little bit of help, saying, hey, in this general vicinity, has anybody seen birds flying? You could ask a county, or a region, or a river, and you'll get lit up. I've gotten lit up for asking that question. You, you know, Basically saying, oh, you want us to scout for you, and you not pay for it. That kind of bullshit. Pardon my French. But... You know, what the hell, man? I asked for a little bit of help. You can just ignore the post. You could ignore the question. If somebody walked up to you on the street or you were at a, uh, at a camp or you were, you were fishing at the docks and you said, hey, um, how's the fish been biting? All right. What, will, what have you seen on the river today? Mm, not much. Okay, well. All right, we'll see you around. You know, you can. You don't have to be a jerk. You don't have to lie either. You can just say, hey, listen, I just don't feel comfortable talking about it because I feel like, you know, I've had people steal my spots. That's fine. You're being a little paranoid. It's public land, right? But it's the same concept, right? If you, you don't have to respond to it. You don't have to tear into somebody for no good reason. You're going to push new hunters and you're going to shove young ones away from our sports and destroy it. I'm convinced that part of the reason we've lost a lot of hunters over the past 25 years is there's a huge combination, but one of, I think, one of the key factors is that a more and more unfriendly environment, not from any hunters, 
not from propaganda in the media, but from people who, instead of taking somebody under their wing or being very kind and saying, listen, I, I can't point you to my favorite spot. I'm not going to take you there. I already have my nuclei of hunting buds. And we all do. We all have our nuclei of our hunting family, our hunting guys and girls that we always hunt with or we try to get together once a year and go to duck camp or deer camp or turkey camp or, or a trapping event or whatever it may be, whatever it may be. And we... We, we have that nuclear, and we can't, we can't really pull anybody else in. They're, they'll be all auxiliary. It won't be comfortable, right? But what we can do is we can give pointers. We can be kind. We can look at them and say, you know what? I can't, I can't really take you. I know you really want to come with me, but here's what I can do. I'm going to help set you up in X, Y, or Z fashion so that you can go out and either find somebody who will need that buddy or find somebody that can show you the ropes or, you know, Learn on your own. I've learned a lot of hunting on my own, especially when it comes to waterfowling. I, my father's not a waterfowler. I was not raised to be a duck hunter. I was raised to be a deer hunter. I was raised to be a rifleman. I, I had to learn wing shooting. I had to learn how to decoy, how to call. I didn't really have, you know, that mentorship. The great thing is about the internet too. You know, we want to look at two sides of a coin, uh, the yin and yang here, is that we've got these, these just, frankly, and I, I'm just going to cuss here, assholes. We've got these assholes that want to treat people like that online and in person. But we've got the guys, and I'm not going to really include myself in this because I don't have that big of an audience, but I'm going to say that we've got guys like uh, Fellowship of the Duck Gun. We've got guys like... Uh, um, you know, outdoor limits and high prairie sportsmen and freelance duck hunting and uh, Virginia Outdoors Unlimited. Uh, name your favorite waterfowl, deer hunting. Keith Warren, um, big name there. Uh, we, we've got a lot of the people that, uh, you, you know, have the bigger name, the bigger audience hunting shows online. And they're able to kind of be that really relatable, that that really um, interactive guy that people can look up to. He can't take you hunting, but guess what? He can show you how he's hunting. He can show you what he does. He can explain his ethics. He can explain the morality of the hunt, of, of hunting and of the harvest, etc., and, and share his personal outlook and personal experience and, and life lessons with you. And I would hope to to do that through my channel as well in a little bit different capacity or whatever capacity I can. But the point being, we've got such a resource of good for young individuals, young adults, and adults that want to get into it that you can almost start hunting any category of hunting. Just pick it. Throw a dart at the board with a category and... You know, it hits a category. You can find videos. You can find blog posts. You can find a lot of stuff. You're going to find the junk. You're going to find the evil, like we've been talking about, too. But, but, you will find the good. And you can pretty much go and do it and learn it yourself through YouTube videos, through hunting videos, through through those blog posts and everything. So, it, it's really, really amazing the good and the bad that we see out of it. And I, I really see the good outweighing it. But once again, we need to focus on being good stewards. We need to focus on overcoming those FUDs that that we've just discussed here, that I've just laid out there. And and so, you know, it's, it, it's really difficult to be positive when you get inundated with that stuff. So we need to, to flood out that negativity with positive things. We need to flood out that negativity with good expressions. It's like recently, if we want to talk about recent events, there's a lot of people buying firearms now that never would or not have not really ever considered doing so before. Ammunition firearms have dried up. I'm really annoyed about it. Uh, I wish y'all, I wish everybody would buy cheap, stack it deep, so that when bad times come, there's still a steady supply of stuff or we're all okay and there's not a huge artificial shortage um, through panic that may or may not be justified, right? But once again, it's the same kind of thing. We need to be good stewards. We need to be good firearms owners and say, you know what? Let's get rid of all the political sh shit 
Let's get rid of all the, the stupidity and just say, hi, my name's Joe Bob. I've been shooting guns since I was a wee lad. I've got some safety training. I have a concealed carry permit. You just bought a pistol for for defense. Do you know anything about it? Can I help you? Is there anything maybe I can offer to you? You know, don't go out of your way to be that know-it-all jerk. But be there and offer. If you see somebody struggling at the range and maybe they do something unsafe, say something. You know, be the be your own range officer. So, hey, 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 watch it, watch it. Do you want some help? And be earnest. Don't be, you know, chastising them because they may not know. As unfortunate as it is, we've got a lot of adults in this country now who have rediscovered their freedoms. So we need to be stewards of them as well. We need to be our brother's keeper, our sister's keeper. We're not here on this world to just be selfish little jerks. You know, there there is another life. I uh, hate to get uh, religious on a lot of people, but uh, that's my belief system. So feel free to, to discard this if uh, you so feel so. I would invite a person to, that was doing that to uh, to come to know Jesus and and uh, be more than happy to have a conversation with somebody like that. But once again, that's the point. We want to have a conversation. We, we can have arguments, we can have conversations, and we don't have to be rude and awful to each other. And, and I guess that's really what I'm getting at here. The last anecdotal evidence I will have of, of, of hunters being our own worst enemy is, is to say this. Um, you know, I, I was uh, hunting out west with a family member, um, and we got on the topic, there was no birds flying, and, and I'm a big talker, as you could tell, you're listening to a 30 plus minute podcast right now of me doing nothing but talking. And so, you know, we were talking about some stuff, and, and I had shot a, a buck, and, and there was some side comment made about, well, maybe if you didn't shoot at everything that walked in front of you, you'd get a bigger buck someday. And to that I said, well, maybe, but at the same time, if I'm hunting on public land, if I don't shoot it, the likelihood is somebody... May ver- you know, I said somebody else will, and that may or may not be true, but that's kind of what I go by. You, you know, I'm a meat hunter. I'll tell you what, guys, I never, ever liked the taste of tag soup, and I've not found a good recipe for antler yet. So if you have one, pass it along. But honestly, those are two awful recipes, and uh, I prefer actual venison in the pot. So... I say that, and essentially, I'm told verbatim that it's assholes like me that are the reason that there are no big bucks around, especially on public land. Okay, so this is in Nebraska, where every little tiny square of public land is surrounded by thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of acres of corn and river bottom that is private land that is either hunted privately or isn't hunted at all. Where the fuck do you think those deer go? (laughs) opening day of rifle season those big bucks disappear not because they're getting shot it's because they've got plenty of places to go that's not being pressured the most ignorant crap ever right so you know i'm told that and i'm you know it's my relative and his buddy and i really wanted to knock the dude's teeth in but he's my cousin's husband so i'm not going to do that and you know, I was kind of didn't want to spoil the hunt. But the more I thought about it, the angrier I got. I felt wronged, and I, I feel justified in feeling that way. But the point being, that is a prime example of somebody ruin, try, almost purposely trying to ruin hunting for somebody else. Saying, well, I completely disagree, so you're an idiot and an asshole. What? What? ridiculous absolutely ridiculous i mean you can argue with me in the comments if you want you know but once again this individual's ethics his personal sportsmanship code says that i let every buck i see walk including on my own property which is the only thing this guy hunts his own property and that's it I will shoot a couple does because I was saying, you know, I don't feel like a lot of people make use of the doe tags. And they're like, well, yeah, we do. And stuff. I'm like, well, how many does are you shooting? Well, and, and basically they were saying, well, everybody's shooting a couple. Well, if you know anything about Nebraska deer herd, you'll know that it gets overpopulated fairly quick because all these whitetails condense on these river bottoms. So 
you really do need a lot of guys filling a lot of freezers every year to knock down these herd sizes. One, for herd health, for the welfare of the herd. And two, for the simple reason that you absolutely can. I mean, if, if the game is, is plentiful and there and, you know, you can legally take enough deer to pretty much feed your family the entire year and you can do it responsibly, why wouldn't you? If, if that's what you want to do, you don't have to. But, but the point being, once again, you know, there, there's a difference between quality deer management and this random, stu- I, I say stupid, but this, 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 this hyper focus on a, I've got to kill the biggest, baddest, most ridiculous buck that ever walked the face of the earth, because that will be the only thing that justifies me as a hunter. I, the, the same guys that think that way, and I'm sorry if you're one of these guys, but and in, in, in this is like the way, again, if this is the way you want to hunt, go ahead. I don't care. But don't bash somebody else because your way of hunting is sitting in the same damn spot for four months with a bow. So you can stick that one buck you've been seeing on trail cam all summer and you never see him. So you just go, oh, well, you know, the neighbors shot him. And maybe the neighbors did shoot him. Guess what? He wasn't yours. Newsflash. He's a wild animal. He doesn't have to do what you want him to do. He's not going to. So. With that in mind, you know, what, what was the point of, of making such a snide jerk comment like that? Oh, I, that? That you're the reason why there's no big bucks, because you shoot everything that's little. And then in a group text to me and a couple of cousins saying that the limit on his land in the pasture that we were allowed to deer hunt in is, you know, one buck a season, no matter what, whether you recover it or not, etc., you get one deer. I had arrowed a, a small buck because I'd never, I've never killed a deer with with a bow and arrow. This rule was never explained to me. You get one buck and one doe off of that property a year. Okay, that's the way you want to do it. That's the way you want to do it. It's your property. You do it the way. I'm, I'm super thankful that I get to hunt on it with you uh, or without you, and that uh, you know we get to do it that way. So obviously that's anecdotal evidence and, you know, I I felt personally attacked by it because I kind of was. But my point is hunters need to stop being so bad towards each other. You can have arguments and we can extend this into other parts of our life. You can have disagreements, you can have arguments, you can have conversation. Don't be an asshole. It's that simple. You know, live by the golden rule. If you don't want to be treated that way, don't treat somebody else that way. Be a good neighbor. Be a good steward of the sport. You know, if if you're not educated on deer management and how taking does can benefit, you know, I was in that situation, I was trying to share what I had learned by reading real research and conveying that, you know, I thought there was a, a better way to manage the deer herd and to end up with bigger bucks eventually. Perhaps I presented that in a way that rubbed this in, these two individuals the wrong way. Well, oops. But that still doesn't justify acting like that at all. And now... I will say, if this individual ever listens to this, and I'm, I, I've made purposeful to say that they're a relative, but I'm not going to name names, obviously. But if they have a problem with this, they can always call me. They know how to get a hold of me, right? The point being, to have a conversation and have an argument is not to treat each other po- poorly. So, and that's kind of the summation of it. You know, what can we do to fix this? And I've kind of covered that multiple times in this this podcast. You know, my four-step plan, it would essentially be this. You know, don't confuse your ethics with what is moral. Just because it's not the way you would do it doesn't mean that it's wrong. We've talked about that already, right? Two, you know, always know that because it is not the way you would do it, whether it's a certain practice, it doesn't have to be your ethical code. It can just be how, you know, 
I don't like to push deer. I don't like to walk a field for pheasants. I don't like to hunt duck. Oh, fine, okay. It doesn't matter which way you don't like to do it. If it's legal and it's moral, there's no problem. Get over yourself, right? So just because it's not the way you do it doesn't mean it's wrong or that it should be shamed or banned or, you know, had some punishment put, up, put upon that action. Three, just be a good neighbor. You know, live by the golden rule. You'll find the more that you start to treat people the way you want to be treated, you will, one, be a happier person, and two, you'll just get much better results out of life. Four, if you can't say something good, whether it's online or in person, or have a thoughtful, educated, meaningful conversation or argument, shut up. Don't run your mouth. And that goes for even if you have a way to say meaningful and argumentative stuff. You know, if you engage with somebody and they don't respond or they're just, they're like, oh, well, I'm still right. Go away from me. You can win the argument all you want. Doesn't mean they're going to believe it, right? So there's that. Check your ego. Just make sure that, uh, you know, and we got to accept that we can be wrong. We can have a meaningful conversation or argument. And do everything right. And you can be on the wrong side. There may not be a compromise or a meeting in the middle and shaking hands and being like, hey, thank you for the, you know, thank you for the insight on your viewpoint. I just still, you know, you can you can shake hands and walk away. No, you might be dead wrong and you might realize it. Accept that. It's hard. It really is. It's not fun. But we need to try and be better people, right? In regular life as well as just being stewards of our sport. And in last five, um, you know, you, you need to you need to be a steward of God's creation, as well as the next generation, and recruiting new adult hunters. I've said it so many times in this. And I, I think it's because I want to hammer home that point. Be a good steward. Just you know, be there for that guy who wants to get into it. You know, oh, I did it once when I was like twelve with my dad or my uncle or my grandpa and. I lost a lot of interest. I had, you know, I never really wanted to do it. But now, now I just look at it. I'm like, oh, man, I can get fresh wild meat or or I can, you know, catch fish or I can learn how to camp. And I just want to get in the world. I want to pass something on to my children someday or, you know, some sort of tradition. They just want to be part of a tradition. It doesn't matter what the motivation is. Be a steward for them. Be a guider. Be, a, be someone who can be that steady rock. If it's just one person or if it's ten dozen doesn't matter do your part and because just that one person you may help might go and help a person or two themselves and it can snowball from there so so just you know be the best example that you can be and that goes for all things in life obviously not just being stewards of hunting but you know take them out if you can if you can't give them pointers maybe offer them an area that's your your last resort or was a place that you started hunting. It doesn't have to be the honey hole. Don't give them the honey hole. Just tell them where they might be able to have some success and let them figure it out on their own. Maybe at minimum, they'll still be like, Oh, well he said it was good. I like to tell people, I, I, I straight up tell people when they ask, and I'm like, I tell them, you know, I can't take you and I'm not going to give you the honey hole, but I'm going to point you in a direction I think you might have some success because I've been successful there. It's not the best, but it's a place to start and cut your teeth. Good enough, right? Good enough. So guys, that is, uh, that's all I've got to really say about that topic. Um, before being edited, this run out it's probably about 50 minutes long. We'll try and cut it down to 30 minute mark maybe, but, uh, as always guys really appreciate the, the comments, the likes, uh, subscribing to the channel, staying up to date by hitting that notification bell. Uh, really, really appreciate all of your, your viewer support. Uh, this is a non-monetized channel. Um, being sponsored by somebody like Warwolf is, is really just through ammo donation. I'm not getting any kickback from it. Um, we're really just looking to, uh, to, to give you guys some new content. I really want to, to share with you guys something I think will be cool and uh, something I believe you'll be interested in, and something that's that's not covered that much. You know, we, there's everybody's doing something on YouTube that's probably been done 10 to a dozen times before. Um, 
it's kind of hard to find a, original things to make content on, but I try and do so and, and give you guys some, some obscure stuff. It hurts the views and it hurts the subscriber count, but guess what? I'm doing it because I, I care about the content and I care about being, once again, an advocate, a steward. <laughs> Bring it back to the real world here um, of the, the 2A community, of the hunting community, and I want to be there as, uh, as a support line for you guys. I don't need to have a, a, a savior complex, right? I just, I, I'm not looking to be that saving light of, of something, but I'd like to be there. If I can help somebody else enjoy the same passions I do, um, I feel like I've, I've, I've done good and, and that um, hopefully they'll be able to take that and take their experience and pass it on to somebody else and so on and so forth. Like I said, it only takes one or two people for helping to, to, to snowball into a big effect and and make the world a better place and, and make our, our shooting sports and our hunting sports uh, all that better and maintain the traditions. So as always, guys, really appreciate the viewership. God bless. Keep your powder dry. I'll see you in the next video. This is Drake, and I'm signing off.